everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I can confidently say this is the biggest group hug I've ever been a part of, so. I am Ginny D, and six years ago, I fell head over heels in love with Critical Role, like I'm sure many of you did. And that, for the first time, made me understand why people love D&D. &D. Uh, and I immediately started playing. Uh, I, I really committed myself to tabletop games. And uh, these days, you might know me from YouTube where I make videos about tabletop games, or if you've been in the Critter community for a while, you might know me from my Jester cosplay, uh, everybody's favorite little blue tiefling. <laughs> I even got to play Laura Bailey's Duplicate one time, highlight of my life. Uh, and now I am a full-time tabletop gaming creator and it all started with Critical Role. I cannot tell you how grateful I am to be standing up here because I would be just as happy sitting with you guys out there watching these incredible friends talk about the stories that they get to tell together. Uh, and I'd probably be a lot less sweaty. So. I know we're all very excited, but while we have a little quality time, just us together, I wanna go over a few guidelines for how this is gonna go. Uh, first of all, please limit yourself to one question for one cast member when we get to the Q&A portion. Uh, please be respectful of our cast and also of your fellow critters around you. And finally, please note that we will be discussing Critical Role and beyond, so if you are not caught up, there may be some spoilers. You have been warned. <laughs> Now, I have so enjoyed our time together, uh, but it is kind of lonely up here. I was thinking maybe we should get the cast out here. Does that sound good? All right, well, I guess let's get this panel started. Get ready to recognize the alpha because here comes Travis Willingham. Spooky goth girlfriend, it's Marisha Ray! He was here when time began and he'll be here when it ends. It's Talis and Jaffe! I'm not mad goofing, it really is Ashley Johnson! O'Brien! Does anyone else hear harp music? It must be Laura Bailey! You can't possibly applaud as loudly as this man deserves, but you can certainly try! It's Matt Mercer! Get the lights back up and have all the cosplayers in the room show off your wares today. <laughs> Mushroom. Mushroom. A little fungal. We got a little fungal. It's just a dumb little mushroom over there. No big. <laughs> All right. Well, how are you guys feeling being at Anime NYC for the very first time? Mm. New yeah. York City is awesome. I love it. Woo! <laughs> it's amazing. This has been so much fun. I have not been to an anime con in so long, and it is, I forgot the energy is so different. It's great, I'm having, I'm having a blast, so. 
Yeah, you guys are fueled by caffeine and fandom. <laughs> Well, we're going to kick it off with uh, some questions that were submitted by our lovely fans in the Beacon Discord. Uh, be sure to sign up for Beacon, and some of you clearly already have. <laughs> uh, I think we should start with some anime questions, since it's an anime con. So, uh, this is for everybody. When dubbing anime versus recording lines for The Legend of Vox Machina, or the Mighty Nine animated series, is your process different when thinking about and getting into the headspace to record dialogue for these characters? Mm. Travis, you want to start us off? <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, uh, you know, with anime, you obviously have a line and then you're trying to match lip flap. There's also a physical performance that's there, so there are a number of things that are informing your read. Um, for Legend of Vox Machina or Mighty Nine, it's a blank slate. Uh, we're also responsible for a lot of the dialogue ourselves and can also throw it out the window at any time. It's just these maniacs in a small room, which shouldn't be legal. Uh, so anything and everything can uh, happen, and we uh, get multiple chances to record it as well. We'll have an original session, a pickup session, uh, animatics will come back, and we'll want to change dialogue or add things. So they're, they're very similar in that, um, uh, I think if you can, I, I refer to anime as the boot camp for, for acting. If you can do anime dubbing, then you can, you can do the, the real thing. Well, and like a group, the group setting is also nice because anime, you're very solitary. It's just you in a booth and with uh, your nerves as opposed to looking at everybody else and they're also nervous. Although, I, I mean, thanks to COVID also, we had, to, we had to break up like some of the early ones. And so there was a lot of like, oh, thank, thank, thank God for anime because we were used to having being able to piecemeal our performances together like we were all in the room. Yeah, wasn't it we recorded the first episode all together and then the pandemic hit? Mm -hmm. And then I don't think we were able to get back in a room together until wow. like the last episode of that season? Or was it season two? Yeah, it was season two. Okay. Yeah, so it's really, it's such a privilege to be able to work off of each other which you don't often get afforded. But that, that said, we do use a lot of anime techniques and stuff when we dub in like the fighting stuff and the magic stuff we get to use all of our uh. yeah i was gonna say it's <laughs> it's kind of a fun uh competition because we'll have to do pickups to picture in the room with the whole cast and then it's like who can do it the quickest to picture mm -hmm. you know so it's like Wait, it's, it's a competition, or is that yeah. just in your yeah. brain? Oh, not for you. It's just not a competition <laughs> it's for you. It's just no. me. It's just me. Everything is a competition. It's not a competition, because I'm the fastest. When you do oh. voiceover, <laughs> when you do any kind of voiceover, it's like being in a holodeck of sorts. And so when you're dubbing anime, there are restrictions. So it's more like Professor X's Danger Room, where the walls move around, and you have to constrict and slide under things and fit into places. And when we're working on our show or, or you know, other kinds of uh, non-dubbing jobs, it is, what's going on there? It's more like the loading room in the Matrix. There's no, it's just whatever we imagine. So it's a different kind of holodeck. There is a competition on reactions though, especially if we go around the room and it's like, we never want to die by fire death or everybody fall from a large ledge. Whoever starts first, it always ramps up to 10 by whoever's last. <laughs> Just run the whole fight, I'm gonna chase it. Just, I don't need to know, we don't, one, not one kick. Give me three kicks, a punch, two ducks, I'm fine. Let's just go, let's just go. <laughs> it's one of our favorite times to laugh at each other in those records. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, if you have to ask if it's a competition, that just means that you've already lost the competition. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's okay. I'd like to think I'm in competition with myself. So. That's, that's what losers say, yeah. Matthew, we have a question for you. Oh, if, hi. <laughs> if you could GM a one-shot from any anime where you have voiced a character, which one would you choose? Oh, no. Dang. Ah, uh, man. Ah. Uh, well, there's, mm, there's different facets that I like of, of different ones. Like, like, when you're coming to like a rich world with crazy powers and stuff, like One Piece first comes to mind. But I will say when it comes to like modern day kind of subterfuge and with a rich magic system, but also with like, I, don't know, I think the, the, the Fate series. 
would actually be a really, really, a really fun one shot to run. It's darker, the magic's intense and visceral, the stakes are extremely high. Yeah, I'd probably, I'd probably, I'm gonna throw in with the, the Fate series, so. Laura, this one is for you. Uh, Toru from Fruits Basket and Jester from The Mighty Nine are, are both raised by just their mothers. How would each of these shows be different if those characters switched places? <laughs> you know... <laughs> Here's the thing. <laughs> At their core, I think Toru and Jester are very similar. Like their goal in life is, is, is in line with each other and that's to make people happy, right? They just do it in very different ways. <laughs> um, everybody would be animals all the time if Jester was with the Somas. <laughs> And if oh. Sprinkle is any indication, they'd all be I dead. All. <laughs> There'd be no show. It'd be over after the pilot. Uh... She went, no, but it's the same thing, though, right? Because, like, Toru disarms people so well. Like, she, she, nobody wants to be her enemy at the end because she's so fucking sweet. Sorry. She's so sweet. And... Jester is the same way. Uh. <laughs> It'd be the same story either way. Thank you. Liam, after voicing Nephrite in Sailor Moon Crystal, are there other classic anime that you'd like to see get the reboot treatment? What's happening? Someone is. Something's powering. We turned on an air compressor behind us. To the. Uh, someone put a quarter in one. This is not a bank. You're breaking into the wrong wall. <laughs> it's my vibrator. <laughs> it's a loud. <laughs> I have a name, dude. <laughs> what was the question? Yeah, let's, let's take that again. <laughs> After voicing Nephrite in Sailor Moon Crystal, are there other classic anime that you'd like to see get the reboot treatment and potentially perform? Um, sure, yes. Um, no. From uh, our earlier days, I always loved a show called Revolutionary Girl Utena. Um, and there was... The voiceover track was great. Our uh, old friend Rachel Lillis starred in that beautifully. Um, rest in peace, we actually just lost Rachel. Um, <laughs> excuse you. Excuse me. Um, but I would love to see like a modernized, slick, uh, for them to bring it back. I always loved the style of that show. Um, she turns into a car in the movie. Um, the other answer I have for this is one of my favorite movies of all time is uh, oh. <laughs> is Akira, which is a m masterpiece. It's just a masterpiece. It's a beautiful film, but it is an adaptation, a very, very condensed one. So I, uh, I would love to see. <laughs> Can you all hear? Can y'all hear that? <laughs> it's not just in my head, right? The manga is far more expansive and goes places that the movie didn't have time for and it's two hours as a film. So if, if anyone is listening anywhere with the power to do this, I would love to see the thing expanded outward and get the whole story. All right, we're gonna take a little pivot to some, uh, some conversation around Bell's Hells. For Sam, with rejoining Bell's Hells as Braeus, how do you handle role-playing a completely new character? Is it hard to separate the different elements of FCG versus Braeus? No. <laughs> They're totally different. It's so refreshing to be a character. You know what? I realize 
I know now why Travis is. Um, <laughs> he, he has been this character the whole campaign who doesn't care about anything because he doesn't really have relationships with any other character and, <laughs> and he has no filter and he has, it's so fun. And now, and now my new guy doesn't really know these new characters that he's just uh, met and interacting with. And it's so freeing and refreshing because I don't have like a hundred episodes of baggage to worry about. Um, and so I get to be Travis. I get to just, <laughs> I get to just say whatever I want to say and do whatever I want to do and no one can stop me. <laughs> you guys, I'm the best. <laughs> I'm, I'm the best. I make the best characters. Yeah, but no, uh, being, being uh, this new character has been really refreshing. I get to do a lot of things that I missed doing from previous campaigns, like ha having high charisma, flirting a lot, being sexy. Um, it's what I do best. So um, it's, it's been a lot of fun, and uh, we'll see, you know. Where he, where he goes. As soon as Chetney and Breas hook up, then we will have a relationship. Woo! Woo! Wolf and cow. <laughs> That's my favorite anime. See, Toru would do great with these guys. I don't know, that'd be considered elder abuse, though. <laughs> Sequel to Tiger and Bunny, Wolf and Cow, coming soon on Anaplex. Okay, Talison. Ah. What? Prepare yourself. <laughs> what was the thought process behind playing a character like Ashton who has chronic pain? Did you know that fans with chronic illnesses would be able to relate? Uh, so many people have heard me say this today. Of, I did not know how many people would relate, and it's a little horrifying. Uh, there was just like, oh God, I hear that. A, I, I, I hear that way more than I thought I was gonna gonna hear it, which is bad. Uh, we're, none of us are okay. Uh, I, I was, it was mostly, I've, I've had chronic pain for, for m most of my adult life, and, it, and it's actually, I've actually finally been able to deal with it a little bit, so it's actually getting better, which is insane. <laughs> ah! I don't know what to do with myself now that I don't have to take migraine pills twice a week. It's crazy. Um, yeah, I just, I thought it was a, I was, I, was, I thought it was just something that I'd never explored, plus the, the way that the, way that, that the character design kind of came out. It was like, why, why wouldn't they, why wouldn't there be damage from that? And I also, I, I felt a little better about having a character who drank a lot, which is, I know, odd, but like, it was definitely like the medicinal aspect of that and, and the way that it kind of makes you not great and makes people assume that you don't like them and things like that. It was just a... It was a good tool to get into a lot of like the weird side effects of, of just constantly looking at people like your, your head hurts because your head hurts. <laughs> mm, yeah, so yeah, that was, that's, my, that's my role on that. That was a downer. Anyway, move, yeah, let's move. <laughs> let's go. Hey. Marisha. Uh -huh. <laughs> this is so fun. <laughs> I, love, I just love the reactions when I say someone's name. Okay, so the animated version of I Have Walked Through Fire is just as powerful but very different from the original. Can you tell us about making that change and keeping the meaning that helps Keyleth grow? Yeah, oh man, such a good episode. Of course, with the entire adaptation of Legend of Vox Machina, um, as well as Mighty Nine, you know, you can't fit everything. You can't fit all the characters or all the moments. So we try to find clever ways to um, truncate and combine and blend. Um, so of course, Patrick Rothfuss's character, Care, was like such a big moment. Yeah, shout out Patrick Rothfuss. I miss him. Um, you know, there wasn't really room in the series to incorporate him in a meaningful way. So um, I was just really stoked with what came out of the writer's room and how that final product ended up and, and really kind of seeing the literal visual representation of that moment, which 
you know, everything um, at the table in the campaign is all make-believe in all of our heads. So being able to see it realized was just super incredible and makes me cry every time I rewatch it. <laughs> also the Neil score. And the Neil score! Shout out to Neil Agri, um, man. And Neil is just such a big like fan and supporter of us as people, so he like I feel like he gets it on like a, a different level. He's just incredible. Is is uh, anyone here looking forward to season three? Soon. We found them. <laughs> All right, Travis. <laughs> Chetney has joked about murdering people when he turned on the full moon. How, how has his Dominox-induced vision affected his outlook towards his lycanthropy, and would his reaction have been different if the vision's victims weren't children? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, uh, I'm stoked to be able to turn into a wolf. I think, I think Chetney had a moment where he doubted whether or not those things had happened because of the Dominox vision, and... Maybe he had repressed or forgotten about it, and he was way, way more terrible than he thought. But I think he's either uh, convinced himself that that was not in fact true, or is totally in denial and just choosing to believe that he didn't gobble up a bunch of kids, <laughs> which would be terrible. Uh, but either way, stoked to be a wolf working with the biggest and baddest on Exandria currently in a plan to take down the moon and somebody that's been around since the calamity. This little chair maker is winning. <laughs> Has no right being there. <laughs> Which is the best. Yeah. It's the ultimate old fogey comeback story. Let's go. <laughs> Respect your elders. <laughs> Ashley. Oh. Hi. You referred to Fern's new look, which is great. I love it. Thank you very much. <laughs> you referred to Fern's new look as being more grounded with recent events. Can you elaborate on that decision and how you think this will affect Fern's role in the party? Ooh. Um, I, you know, I, I, in thinking of where we were going, what we were doing, some of the stuff that Fern wears just really is not practical. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, obviously this is fantasy and, and we can, we make everything work, but um, I don't know, I wanted, I, I, okay, for me personally, I was the last kid in my family, so I had a lot of hand-me-downs, and I had, um, I still have like a lot of my dad's shirts, and there's something that I like about wearing people's clothes that are important to me. That sounds so weird. Um, but I think that's, that's also why I wanted to like take FCG's jacket and it's a part of like being close to somebody and feeling, it kind of feels like a, like a hug, I guess. Um, oh. um, but yeah, I just wanted something like a little more practical, still fern, um, still fashion. Um, but yeah, I think just, I mean, it's hard to, to, to go on the journey that we've been going on and to not, to not take it in and feel a little more grounded and, and have the seriousness of the situation. And, you know, I think, I think Fern's ready to get down and dirty. And so I wanted to have the clothes to be like, that's kind of the last thought for her now, of being flashy and ferny. And it's still there a little bit. So I think we're ready to start taking your questions. There is a microphone right here, and the lovely Brittany will be handling that, the line. Uh, this is exciting. For each question, two of you must fight for the chance to ask. Oh my gosh, your outfit is so cute. Thank you. Thank you. 
um, of that dress. I have a question for you. Oh, okay. Uh, you have put so much heart and soul into all the campaigns throughout the years and tying all the character stories together. How fulfilling has it been for in, during campaign three with the Bell's Hells to have them meet all the characters and see all their stories tie together? It's been the best. It's something I've always wanted to kind of do since I began playing this game in high school, was to have, have a consistent group of players across multiple campaigns in the same world where I can show them the impact that they left with previous games, that I could show their characters living on and being affected and affecting them in their current story. And as many of you who have played many RPGs out there know, it's hard to have consistent groups for that long. So that I had this opportunity, I was not going to waste it. <laughs> um, so yeah, like it, it, it was something I always hoped I'd be able to do, and now that I have the chance, I'm, I'm cherishing it immensely, and it's kind of my gift to them to be like, hey, you, you've changed this world, you helped forge it and, and build where it's gone. You know, now you get to see the effects of that, and now join with your previous selves in a weird soup of your own creation, so. Uh, no, it's been an absolute blast. I don't like the way that sounds. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, guys. Uh, firstly, I came all the way from Canada to be here, so love you. Um, <laughs> um, so my question's for Sam, and it's kind of silly. Sam, have you seen the Matt Mercer Hosier t-shirt? This, this, isn't, this isn't it, but of course. I have, I have several Google alerts set for any photograph of Matt that might be used against him. Uh, I have seen the Hosier shirt. Oh my God. Uh, uh, there was some talk of it on our company Slack. It was a company-wide discussion instantly. I, I my campaign's like uniform now. I would love, I, I, need, I need it. Oh I need no. It. <laughs> in fact, we should do like a whole series of shirts of Matt in different bands. And I Matt, need critical role One Direction. I, want, I need that. I want Matt as Gautier. <laughs> I need I Mercer as, as the Spice Girls. <laughs> or, or the lead singer of Creed. Oh yeah. Yes. With Holmes, White Hole Pond. <laughs> Thank you so much, Thank guys. You. Thanks. Uh, hey, my, welcome to New York City, by the way. Love seeing you guys. So my question is for Matt, specifically uh, with your role as Vincent Valentine in this new Final Fantasy VII review. Yes. So regarding this, Vincent Valentine's story has concluded in his standalone video game, Dirge of Cerberus, correct? And, but this new Rebirth universe, his story might change a little bit. Uh, I was wondering what's your opinion on, or rather how you see uh, his story ending, because we already saw certain aspects of that game already with Yuffie's DLC. I want to ask regarding if you rather have a remake or you want to see a remaster of this video game? Oh man, I mean, I'm not against exploring more of Vincent's story, that's for sure. Um, I, I love the idea and the concept that the remake rebirth, like this, this, this remake series is familiar, but also kind of expanding in its own ways and charting its own path. So it doesn't feel like it's overshadowing what came before, it's kind of living alongside it. Um, that way, you know, the previous Vincent Durge Cerberus, voiced by the incredible Steve Bloom, who's a dear friend, you know, that, that it always exists alongside this story and this interpretation. If we get to revisit aspects of that and expand upon it, I would love that, especially like to your point, given the, the, the slight variations and kind of some of the newer takes and expanded facets we get to explore with, you know, what little bit in, in Rebirth there was and hopefully far more we get to do in the next one. Uh, I'd, lo I'd love that. Personally, um, as to what they have planned, I don't know. They don't tell me these things, yeah. but uh, <laughs> uh, but I'm always down to answer the call if they ever have a reason to call me in. Please do, especially with the implications of the ending of Dirge of Cerberus. <laughs> <laughs> For those who know. Yeah. Shh. <laughs> Hi, guys. 
guys, I'm Sarah. Um, hey, hey. Um, my question's for Ashley. Um, Ashley, Campaign 3 has been your first campaign where you've gotten to be there the whole time. Yeah. Um, Fern is one of the best characters in all the campaigns. Matt, I think you have said I love you, Ashley, while laughing the most during this campaign because of Fern's shenanigans. So I wanted to ask you, like, for you, how does it feel to be there the whole time and really develop and evol evolve this character um, and being, being able to be with the whole group the whole time. And for you guys too, how wonderful has it been Good. to have Ashley there the entire time? Because <laughs> so much of the previous campaigns are like, we miss you, we love you, and, and you've gotten to be there and interact with everybody. So what has that experience been like? It's been the best. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's prior to actually coming out here to New York to work on the show that I was working on. Um, we had played together you know, every every time we play together, I was I was there. So, it it feels like coming home again. But also, when you are consistently at the table, um, your character evolves so much more, and you're affected so much more by the story and everybody around you. And it's it's been so fun. It's been so fun to be there, and and I love this group so much. <laughs> And I to get to spend time with them as much as I get to now is the greatest. Yeah. Thank you so much. Hello. Hello. My name is Rowena. Uh, my question is for Matt. Um, what do you do to get into the mindset of the different characters that you play so that you're taking actions or talking or making decisions as them and not them bleeding into one another or playing like as yourself? It's a good question. Um, harnessing your psychosis helps. Uh, no, I, I, for me, whenever I break down NPCs, whether it be initially creating them or preparing for a, a session where they might appear, I have a very quick series of like single word notes to remind me kind of their vocal timbre and texture, any accents or, or dialects or affectations they might have, as well as maybe a quick breakdown of their mood and vibe, as well as maybe a few story notes that are important. So I can like quickly glance down as the players are talking and we're getting close to that or they're starting to discuss talking to this individual and kind of remind myself where they were. But a lot of it too is just like, as a performer, when you're, creating or creating your uh, personification of a character. You have to kind of build out the world of what they're living and what they're going through in advance so you can kind of step into them uh, in a comfortable way. So the process is pretty similar for, for me in doing that. Um, and a, a lot of that is it's just, it's goal oriented. What are these characters' goals? Goals will drive their decision making and their reactions to those around them. So even just the quick, succinct question to yourself when you jump into that character is, what is their goal in this moment? Are they trying to gain friendships? Or are they trying to gain allies? Are they trying to gain access to something, someone, or some place? Are they trying to get away and not be noticed? You know, just that one singular goal will inform all of the ways they interact with people around them. So even just that little nugget could help you define a scene or define uh, how you interpret that character. That's great advice for acting as well in general. That's just awesome. So hopefully that's helpful. Thank you. And also it's so, as fun as it is to like spring a character on Matt that maybe he wasn't expecting. <laughs> that was really great. Um, to be able to like sit at the table and watch him have an argument between three or four characters <laughs> is phenomenal and like what was great is in like those most recent episodes where it was like four female characters and each one was clearly defined like we knew who was speaking and it just by your mannerisms and your body posture and and just like the timber of your it was so so great and to that point another addendum posture and physicality even just carrying yourself differently for each sort of character will have a whole different mood that you'll just instinctually slip into as you perform them. So consider that too. Good question. Hi. 
Um, my question's for Ashley. So back in EXU Prime, when met with a future version of herself, Fern once said that it didn't seem like her future looked very bright. Now that most of the things that that Fern told her were, came true, and knowing what lies ahead, does Fern still believe this? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Evil Fern. I know. Um, God, I, I don't really want to give anything away, but um, yes, I think she still believes it. Mm -hmm. I think there's that, that, that's always kind of there of a possibility in front of her, but I think in the meantime, it's like, well, what can I change and how can I make things better before that happens? I watched EXU, but sure for the did. people who didn't, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I, I really would love to hear your opinion on it. My wife is here. My mom is here. You just deflecting? Uh -huh. <laughs> They're so beautiful, I love them both. Um, yeah, I think that's something that she constantly thinks about. But, you know. Everything, I, I think Fern really wears a mask of everything's fine and everything's, everything's great and I gotta make sure everybody's happy and we're having fun and I think it's, you know, it's a, it's a big mask to cover the, the, what's going on inside. But I think that's something that she knows is a possibility but is desperately trying to maybe change that, but we'll see. Sam, TLDR, there was like an evil fern, like doppelganger who like popped out of a portal who was like, you're a bad person. You're real bad. Oh, she was real bad. Encourage him. That seems like, a, that sounds like no. a good episode. Make him work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically our logo right now is Fern's inner turmoil. Yeah. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. There'll be no passing notes in class. Don't do that. Yeah, you got the shirt. Yes. I had to. I had to. Sam did a great job with that. To. My question is actually for you, Sam. Um, so I am a product of uh, improv. A lot of my teachers used The Art of Play by Gary Izzo. Um, and I know a lot of you guys also do improv as it is. Do you have any other books or suggestions for people that are looking to get into The Art of Yes And? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you about them. Uh, I think there's a Charna Halpern book. Uh, I forget what it's called, Impro or something that uh, I remember reading. Um, but uh, honestly, it's it's been so great to do improv with these guys because because what we do, you know, we we're, we are doing a shared story. Um, but a lot of what we do is really rooted in in improv um, and just being able to to say yes to each other and build on uh, on everything and build on the reality that we create with each other has been so amazing. And it's such a great tool for actors, for writers, and just for life itself. You wanna be a person in life who says yes to things, um, just in general. Um, and uh, if you can make that part of your, uh, your life in any way, be it professionally or personally, it's, it's the greatest. So yes, uh, I highly recommend doing any improv, and I, I'll post some books on my Twitter. Uh, Truth and Comedy? Is that what it's called? You that to me. Did I? Truth and Comedy. I suggested that to Ashley. Oh Did you read it? Well, you didn't suggest it to me. You had no, talked I, about it one time before, I and I read it, and it was great. Hey, I'm so wise. You're so wise. <laughs> I don't remember who the author is, though. Eh. I wrote it. I wrote that book. It was Sam Red. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll actually echo Sam, though, because I that question has come up a lot and it comes up a lot when people come through our signing lines of like what are your suggestions for getting better at acting or role playing and it's always improv yeah. like traditional acting classes are great and 100% have their places and you should do them as well but to echo exactly what Sam said even if you're in sales or you're in marketing or if you're in any other department improv is still good because it also teaches like it teaches quick reaction time and thinking on your feet and making strong choices in the moment. So, um, and, and it listening. doesn't have to be UCB. It doesn't have to be Groundlings. It doesn't have to be these like crazy expensive classes. Like, 
like look into your local improv troupe and just have fun. It's a really great tool. Yeah, I'll say off that too, the other big thing you learn from that, and it's a great thing to keep in mind, is listening. Yeah. You know, your, your, your ability as a performer on stage or as a table playing a game with your friends can only improve by intently listening to everyone else at that table. If you're focused on what you're gonna say next, it's not gonna be authentic and it's not gonna fit with everybody else at the table, everybody else on stage. Often being aware and listening to everyone else around you, you'll find the inspiration and collaboratively build a better scene and altogether a better experience. So that's another great skill you learn from improv too. I also want to jump in. It teaches you to listen, and that is super important for every... <laughs> Sam, I love your stat, uh, ad bits, excuse me. Um, my question is for Liam and Sam, or just Liam, um, about, <laughs> it'll make sense in a moment. Um, about four years ago, um, there was a very contentious race for the 69th presidential <laughs> campaign. Um, and so I was wondering, um, are you gonna run for a second term? Or is there another seat you might be running for? Uh, I would like to take this moment to officially bow out of the race and formally endorse Ashley Johnson for president. <laughs> for the he's good just, of the hobby. He's too old, he's just too old. special guest joining us right now. Oh! oh. It's my mom. Mom Lynn. I love I love everyone on stage yes. and I love everyone in the audience. <laughs> but my question is for Sam. <laughs> I happen to know that ever since you were a little boy, when you were ever asked what you wanted to be when you grow up, you always said a minotaur. <laughs> Is that true? Lenore, is that true? And I wonder if that affected your choice. That's I mean, that was Thank you, mother. At, the, at the Greek theater. Don't want to put you on the but spot. You, you're, you're the one who just said to follow my dreams. You took me to all those cow fields and, <laughs> and let me stomp around in the dung, and uh, you inspired me. <laughs> you inspired me to follow my dreams and become half cow. <laughs> and I couldn't have done anything without you and your support, and I love you so much. I love you so much. Love you, Mom Lib. Wow, lore drop. Hi. First off, I just wanted to say I started watching Critical Role back during, even before the Briarwoods, and I want to say, you know, way back, and I say thank you because you saved my sanity during veterinary school. <laughs> so, I, I guess for everyone, for, for Marisha, so we're coming up on the, this is the 50th anniversary of D&D. And I mean, I've been playing since three five. Some of you guys have been playing since the Red Box days. How does it feel knowing that you guys are one of the um, main drivers for the D and D Renaissance in the past three years, in the past several years, and the legacy that you're going to leave behind is going to be as big as honestly Eberron, Forgotten Realms. Even you're going to be a lasting legacy in the game. How do you guys feel about? I guess what are you guys thinking about that? Yeah. Oof. <laughs> Look on your face. I, I've been thinking about it for the entire last decade. Some of us up here <clears throat> are major Dragonlance fans as kids and how much those stories have stuck in people's minds for decades and you know it's very the parallels are have been so obvious and and, and magical and, and just have tickled tickled my brain. Um, 
it's something that we've loved doing together so much, and one of the one of the many blessings of this road that we're on is having watched it sort of blossom far beyond anything I could have imagined as a kid, and people following along for our Goonie stories, getting together for the first time with a group of friends, and we've heard that story over and over and over again. And the idea that our noodling about and Matt's magical world and our broken wizards and strange blue ladies are going to last for so long is, that's magic. It is total magic. Yeah, when we first started and we were uh, in Lauren Travis's living room trying to debate if we should do this, if we should, um, you know, stream the show after an offer from Felicia Day over at Keegan Sundry. And one of the driving factors, yeah, shout out to Felicia. One of the driving factors was even if this just encourages one to a, a dozen people to pick up a player's handbook and play Dungeons and Dragons, it was such a gift to all of us that was worth it to, to just try and shed light on it and have other people have this same incredible experience that we have had. Um, cut to 10 years later, uh, and it's incredible seeing how many people who have jumped into it. I mean, even Ginny, you talking at the very beginning, jumping into it after watching us, and that's literally all we wanted and could not have even imagined that it would become as big as it is. So thank you for your kind words. That's incredible. Thank you for thank you. Good day to all of you. Good day. Good day. <laughs> <laughs> so this is for Matt. As we're all hoping for, for the third campaign, could we expect some Avengers Endgame scenario for the final battle against Lunas or Pratathos? <laughs> Who knows? Um, there are, there are many forces at work in Exandria right now to tackle very many facets of this incredibly dangerous, world-altering series of events. Um, we have a number of estranged uh, alien entities from the Red Moon Ruidus that are seeking, uh, whether it be asylum or assimilation upon the realm. We have the possible long-sealed god-eating entity Pradathos that is now uh, pushing to be awakened. There are so many different things happening that require a lot of different powers and points of attention. Um, all, in the, all to facilitate this one little group of asshats um, <laughs> who somehow had a very important responsibility thrust upon them. So uh, I guess we'll have to see. We can certainly try. We can indeed certainly try. <laughs> So great to see you guys. Uh, you look much better in person. No, not that that's bad. I, it's... No. I am Speak your truth. <laughs> it is so nice to see you in person, much larger than the small uh, faces on my phone. I am going to go um, back to we production are much larger. immediately she, and be like, we, we need get a bigger lights. screen. We need bigger <laughs> <laughs> My question is mainly for Sam. Um, Coming into uh, Bell's Hells now and coming in with a new character, how do you find the right balance of uh, the amount of backstory to have stuff to play with while also getting enough to find what you get at the table? I think for all of us at the beginning of campaigns, we want to hold back our backstories as much as we possibly can just because it's fun to reveal it in, in uh, small bursts to our friends and to the audience. But for a late... Uh, a late campaign entry like a Breus or a Terry and Darrington, uh, my, my, my philosophy is like, just get it all out in the first episode because there's no time to waste. I don't know how many episodes are left in this campaign. Could be two, could be 200. <laughs> it's not 200. <laughs> um, but uh, it's, uh, yeah, I, I came in with a, a good amount of backstory and uh, I think I got most of it out already. So, um... You're a liar. No, you didn't. <laughs> no way. No way. How do you do, how do, you do that face? <laughs> it's not it, is it? 
Do it, Matt. Do the wolf face. There it is. Dance monkey. Of course, yes. Um, this question is basically for uh, Matt and Mercer. I've been, I have a voice acting background and I've been playing D&D for a long time. Um, one of the most fun times that I've had with playing D&D was back in university when I got to play with a bunch of other voice actors and theater goers and you know, we had a lot of art, like the RP there was some of the top notch stuff that you could have at least for us. Uh, nowadays, it's, uh, you know, We've moved on, we've separated, gone our separate ways, and uh, you know, people living in different countries now, and for me, that's probably one of the most fun times that I've had. Oh yes, of course. <laughs> I will. Um, so, my question is, is that when we're playing with D&D with a lot of other people now, there are so many ways to play, and there are so many ways to have fun. But the thing is, with all of these different kind of people, is that if you're putting your heart and soul into a scene, and you're trying to act out something in order to make a, have a sort of reaction, you can't always expect you know, just re people to react. Some people aren't exactly capable of that. So for me, I wanna kind of chase that thing to get back into that sort of thing. And is there any sort of places, you know, it's always already hard enough to get a group together, let alone to get a group together that can play off of each other in such a meaningful way that are there, do you know of any resources or any things that, uh, that we could do in order to go there? It's a good question. I mean, you know, part of, of building a campaign to the tastes of what you enjoy about this game uh, is about seeking out people of similar interest at the table. And a lot of that is having that session zero conversation about, you know, what, what do we enjoy the most? Do we like to kick down table or kick down doors and defeat monsters and take their loot? Uh, is that our focus? Do we like to do rich intrigue and narrative-based stories? Do we just like the thrill of heroic adventure? Are we more thespian-like performers at the table? Are we more interested in just flowing with the narrative? Those are important conversations to have at the top. But also, not every table is gonna be right for you too, and that's okay to be like, you know what, you guys are still having fun. Maybe this isn't for me, I'm gonna try and find another table. That's entirely viable. Um, but to your point, it can be hard sometimes, depending on where you are, what you have at your disposal, to find the right table. Uh, sometimes it's checking out your local game stores and seeing spaces that host games. Uh, there's online places, forums in your local area that might have kind of looking for group scenarios. And there are websites now that do connect people with groups for like digital online play. Um, and you can go ahead and do searches in those spaces to very specific types of games you're looking for. You could say like, all right, who's available in this time window, this time, you know, once a week, once every two weeks, a few times a week for more narrative focused gameplay, uh, for more of like a, a deep, you know, storyline with emphasis on heavy role play. And you can search for groups that are looking for players like that. That's primarily for online play, but those are at your disposal. So you can search for some of those services online. Um, other than that, it's just kind of the internal search for the right group, which is part of the journey of being a tabletop role player. <laughs> I'll, good luck. I'll, I'll, also, I'll also add, if, like, if you work with people, it's always where you, it's kind of hard to tell who was like, the, who were the theater kids in high school who are no longer the theater kids. And they might say, like, you might like find the, the, the four that are hiding uh, around who are like, yeah, I want to get that vibe again. Also, your voice is amazing, and I feel like I was put under a spell while you were asking your question. It was amazing. Okay, we got one more question. Time for one more. Sorry. I All right. Line. I think uh, someone at this table feels a little neglected, so I will ask Travis a question. <laughs> My question for Travis is, if you could pick one character that you've played to like hang out with IRL and have a beer, 
who would it be and why? Oh, man, definitely not Chetney. <laughs> can't, can't trust that guy. It would be my buddy Grog. <laughs> That would be easily the biggest bar tab in all of history, and we would be arrested by the end of the night. I'd pick Chet. You'd pick How Chet? How fun would Chet be to go get a beer, a grouchy old man? No, thank you. <laughs> what would thank Grog you. think of Ford if they were sitting at a bar together? What, a small little green guy? <laughs> what would a wimp. <laughs> Who uses swords? Oh, I did. I don't know. Grog would, Grog would get in bar fights. I feel like he would be a hard hang because he'd always want to, like, start something. No, that makes him the best hang. <laughs> it's always fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming to this panel. Before we go, we just have a few more, a uh, few quick announcements, and then one final question for the cast. Uh, first of all, I just want to let you guys know that I have my own panel in like two hours. It's yes. a panel Go check her out. Oh, give it up for oh, Jenny, Jenny D. D. Hey, Jenny D. They gave me a huge room, and I'm really nervous about filling it, so please, if you have nothing to do, please, God. Uh, <laughs> but also, be sure to come visit some of our awesome partners on the convention floor, uh, Pin Club at booth 225, and Hex and & Company at booth 1B70. And a final question. Sorry. I said 1B70. Oh, yes, that's the one. Uh, my final question is, what is one thing that you guys can talk about that has you super excited for the future of Critical Role? <laughs> well, we're coming up on our 10-year anniversary. <laughs> which is a crazy thing. Uh, for those of you that haven't checked out Beacon, please do. There's going to be stuff that's added to Beacon in the, in the coming months. It's got some exciting things that are happening there. And as we move into next year, obviously, we've got season three of The Legend of Vox Machina on October 3rd. It's so good, you guys. And Mighty Nine sometime after that. Are you guys excited for Mighty Nine? Yeah, I would just say, you know, stay tuned to our socials, sign up for the newsletter, uh, because we have been talking for quite some time about all the fun stuff we want to do for our 10-year anniversary. It's going to be like a year-long celebration. We're, I don't spoil anything, but we're looking at a lot of live shows. <laughs> And we're hoping to announce all of them, like, soon. So just keep your eyes peeled because, you know, we might be heading to a town near you. We've also been cooking pretty hard on Daggerheart. We're super excited about that. Um, anybody who is part of the beta, thank you so much for, for your feedback. Uh, those who haven't had a chance to check it out yet, uh, we'll have some announcements soon, but it's, uh, it's real good, you guys, and we're real proud of it. So hope you get it. Look forward to that uh, next year. Anything else? Anything else? Anything else? You guys, your energy is amazing. Thank <laughs> you so much. Thank you all so much for coming. Give it up one more time for the cast of Critical Role.